Jesus. Jesus is coming again. What do you say? And it's always a good thought to know that our Savior and King Jesus is coming again. And this evening, we will look once more in the book of Revelation at the manner in which Jesus will come. Welcome to all of you in sanctuary. Welcome to all of you who are online. We are all, always uh, happy to have you with us. And especially those who, you know, are afar in, on a different continent. I know some of you are watching from the UK. I get the messages. And I know many of you are in the, are in the USA. And I want to say welcome to you who are far afield. And um, welcome to those who are in Jamaica, but outside of Kingston. We, we are grateful that you have been with us. And we look forward to having a wonderful time in the Lord as we study from the book of Revelation again. Now, I want to remind those of you who are online that this is a seminar and we encourage your participation and so therefore you can do so by asking your questions in the various chat groups or the chat portal on YouTube or on Zoom and the questions, comments will be relayed to us at the end of the session. We will have the Q&A when the panelists will answer your questions as best as possible. Now, I want to give a brief overview of where we are in the series. We are doing 17 lessons, and we are at lesson number 15 tonight. Can you believe that? Oh, no. I, I feel like I, you know, we started this journey last week, and I can't believe it has been, well, we're going into the fourth week, and we are winding down. But as I said uh, yesterday, that there will be an announcement that will be made by the hosts with regards to the closing events of this series, and you might be in for a surprise. I know that, especially after yesterday, many of you have been coming to say, boy, this thing can't finish. We can't finish so quickly. You know, <laughs> there are so more things that they, they want to learn, and, um, uh, you know, and they are warming up, and some are even saying that they need to invite their friends to, um, to come and hear. Well, it's not too late. You can still, you can still invite your friends to come for the, for the next two um, sessions until graduation. And also remember that all of the lessons are online. They are on YouTube. And so you can still share them with your friends. And I, I have been doing that. I have been sharing it with friends um, who couldn't get to watch them live but are benefiting from the uh, YouTube channel. So you can do that. I encourage you uh, to do so. So tonight, we'll be looking at the king on the white horse. And come Wednesday night, we'll be looking at the ball of fire. Want to know what that's all about, this ball of fire? Come Wednesday night. And then on Sabbath morning, we will be looking at the new heaven and the new earth. So uh, stay tuned and uh, prepare to come to hear what Revelation has to say about these interesting topics and see how they affect us. Now, we are going to, as I said, look at the the king and the white horse tonight. Many views 
are out there in Christendom about the manner in which Jesus will return. And the, the goal of the lesson tonight is to uh, show you from the word of God how Jesus will come, how he says he will come, how uh, prophets and apostles said that Christ will come so that you will be without any doubt as to how Jesus will appear. It is very crucial for as we have seen in lessons past that Satan will appear as an angel of light, deceive if, even if it were possible, well, if it were possible, even the very elect. Yes. Do you know who the elect are? <laughs> That's a very safe answer. Well, let, let us hear it. Children of God. Oh, this mic isn't on. The children of God. All right, the children of God. Very well. Yes. The children of God. Um, anybody has an, a more specific answer? I mean, that's fine. That's fine. Yes, a very safe answer. What anybody else wants to try? What elect? You want to try? No, or, or you don't want to try? <laughs> or you didn't hear the question, who are the elect that Jesus says that if it were possible, even they would be deceived? All right, yes, let's, let's, let's try this one. God's remnant people, church. Yeah, I mean, that's a good answer because as we have been saying that um, those who will be ready to meet Jesus, who will be ready for Jesus to come, will be the people who are the remnant that the Bible calls the remnant. And so... Yes, so Jesus is saying that the deceptions will be, um, will be so intense. Deceptions, you know, will be, will be so good that even the elect, if they are not careful, will be swept away. Last night, for those of you who were here, when we looked at the, the seven plagues, Armageddon and the seven plagues, and in the Q&A, some things came out about um, what Satan will do. Uh, we went back to a previous lesson, the lesson that we looked at, the dragon of Revelation, and we saw the, in the Bible where Satan himself will appear as an angel of light, um, you know, ministers, his angels as ministers of righteousness, and they will deceive. Jesus himself said, when we get into the last days, just before he comes, many false Christs, false Christs will appear, but be not deceived. If they are out in the desert, go not out there, you know, um, and so on. But let me not get ahead of myself in this lesson. So let us go speedily to the lesson after, after I get my Bible. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know what is wrong with me for these last few sessions where, you know, um, I've been forgetting my Bible. But thank you so much. For the the All right. Oh, we have a reader, a young reader again with us this evening, Deandra, who will be reading for us. We are always happy to have our young people involved in this work of evangelism. So we, somebody said amen. Yes, amen. Let us, you know, yeah, let us, you know, encourage them. Right. Now, number one, what name other than Jesus Christ is given to the white, the rider, on the white horse in Revelation 19, verse 11. Let us pray before we get into the lesson. Thanks for that reminder. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again 
asking for your guidance. May your spirit come into our hearts and may he guide this study, we pray. And may hearts be changed and encouraged, I pray, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Deandra, Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. All right. So the Bible says that his name is called what? Faithful and faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. With what? is the color white associated. And we're going to look at a few texts. Revelation 19, verse 8. Psalm 51, verse 7. And Revelation 6, verse 2. And D'Angelo will read for us again. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen in the righteousness of saints. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And Revelation 6, verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right. So in the Bible, white is associated with purity. Yes. Wonderful, yes, that's good. <laughs> Purity, um, righteousness. And when we did the, the, the seals, the seven seals, the first horse was a white horse, and the rider on it um, had a bow. And remember, we said that that horse represented the church in its uh, pure state, in its apostolic state, when shortly after Christ left, and the apostles took the gospel to the then known world. And so white is associated with purity, righteousness. Now, describe the king on the white horse. What does Revelation 19, 12, 13, and 15 tell us is about as the white well horse? As a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And out of his mouth got a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. All right. So uh, we see... Jesus, as if with, with his garments dipped in, as if they were dipped in blood, we see out of his mouth a sharp sword with which to strike down nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And it looks so different from how Jesus came. In the first advent, you know, he came uh, as a lamb, the lamb to, to die for the sins of the world, and he was uh, beaten, you know, his beard plucked, he was, um, he gave his back to the, striper, to the stripers, right, yes, and his beard to and his, his face to them that plucked out the beard. Yes. So it's a completely different picture of Jesus. He's coming now as a conquering king. And talks about a, a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. And he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now, recall that we have been saying that when 
all the, the empires who have ruled earth pass away one by one, one after the other. Dan, um, in Daniel, we saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome, pagan Rome, and then papal Rome. And then just before Jesus comes, there is another little revelation. 13 um, shines or magnifies that last bit of time just before um, Jesus comes. And we saw where people roamed, so for the deadly wound yesterday, we remember we saw that, 1798. And then there's another little kingdom that comes up just before, um, which was? <laughs> you, better, you better get this right. After the deadly wound, after people roamed, so for the deadly wound in 1798, then which other power came up? After that, that we looked at? The beast, the United States of America. Exactly, the lamb like this, which is the United States of America, right? And it will create an image to the beast, to the first beast, which is papal Rome. And, and then uh, it will cause all the world to wander after the beast again, right? Yes. And then. We saw in the plagues yesterday, Armageddon and, and the plagues, that after that happens, then the plagues will fall, the seven plagues. And then in the seventh plague, Jesus returns. And so we see all the proud empires that have ruled the world, one by one, they come and they fall. And then Jesus puts in his appearance with his rod of iron to rule the world with an everlasting kingdom, Daniel tells us, which will last forever and ever. Yes, my dear friends, we are coming down to that time because as we, as we saw yesterday that the, U, that the U.S. is doing its thing to put measures in place to enforce the mark of the beast. And so we know, my dear friends, that we are in... The final, yes, the final what? I like, I like how you put it. <laughs> Tell us, the final episode. All right, yes. Yeah. Yes, man. So we are in the final, the final um, episode, as Brother Kuzle tells us. So Jesus comes as a conqueror, a conquering king, and a king who is going to war. And of course, we know that this is the most uh, dramatic event in the universe as since the war in heaven, as he is coming back to earth to put down the reign of the dragon once more, and, to, and as we will see what he will do next. So let me not get ahead of myself. Number four, who is seen with the king on the white horse? Revelation 19, verse 4. Deandra. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. All right. So the Bible says that the, and the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses. Who constitute the armies of God? Angels. All right, yes, very well. And the Bible is consistent, you see, because we looked at passages like in Matthew 26 where Jesus says um, that the Son of Man will come sitting at the right hand of power and with the angels of God. Remember that? Yes. So Revelation 19 is corroborating what the rest of the Bible says. So it agrees with the rest of the Bible that Jesus is coming militantly 
and he is coming with his armies, the armies of heaven. It was the same army that we saw in Revelation chapter 12 that fought. Remember, um, the Bible said that Michael and his angels fought, right? The dragon and his angels, but they prevail not. Yes, so it is the same armies, you see. And this time we know it is Jesus that is leading the armies of heaven. So I wonder who the Michael is in Revelation 12 that was leading, that was leading the armies of heaven in that war. Huh? <laughs> who? The archangel of mercy. All right, Michael the archangel. You say the archangel of mercy. Where did you get that from? The archangel of mercy. <laughs> I understand the archangel, but the mercy part. Where, where you got that from? I know that you are a, a very well... A Fulbright student. A Fulbright, yes. <laughs> yeah, I can put it that, yes. <laughs> a well-versed. Well, Gabriel is the death angel, and sometimes when Michael come in, or archangel by him, him come in and sympathize with things, so him get it to be the archangel of mercy. Well, I've never heard it put that way before, but... Um, um, <laughs> we, we will have to look more into that one. <laughs> what did you say? Michael is Jesus. Say it again. Michael is Jesus. But that's a very radical statement that Michael is Jesus. Yeah, right? Jesus Christ. Are you sure? Yes, the Bible. Why, why? Because what? <laughs> All right, so that's a very radical statement that Michael is Jesus. And it sounds reasonable because we see... All right, somebody else wants to try. So let me hear this one. Yeah, Michael is... Um, Jesus, actually. Jesus is Michael incarnate when he came on earth as a babe. Yeah, so he was Michael in heaven. And why they call him archangel is that... Not that he's an angel per se, but he's over the angels. He's in charge of the angels. Okay. And his very name means who is like God. Some put it as a question, but yes. this is actually a statement that this being is like God. In other words, he's God. Ah, yes. The only well, thing that can be is Jesus. Can't be another angel. Okay, all right. <laughs> Interesting. You want to try, you want to add to it? I'm just saying this is in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Yes. Jude 9, where Jesus was contending. Let's again, Michael and the archangel were contending with the devil for the shooting of Moses' body. Okay, so that's in Jude, Jude 1, Jude, verse 9. Jude, yeah, Jude, Jude 9. 9. Yeah. Yes, that and Michael the archangel, when he was contending with the devil, mm -hmm. he disputed about the body of Moses. All right. And they said, you, you, you also sit in Daniel 12, where the Bible said, um, there will be a time of trouble, and at that time, Michael shall stand up that great prince for his people yes all right you, you are you are correct i i must agree with you so we see in the bible that michael um says that the humans the redeemed are his people in daniel chapter 12 no angel has ever claimed that or can ever claim that because uh, to whom do we belong as people to God absolutely and to Jesus but to, to God yes for he created us and he redeemed us so when the Bible says that the great prince who stands for his people so that's one clue and then we see consistently that Michael is over the prince of the hosts and Michael is in charge of the armies of heaven in Revelation 12 and then in Revelation 19 now, we see Jesus leading the armies of heaven. And so we see the consistency and we can conclude that Michael is the same as Jesus. And as my brother said, the very name Michael means one who, well, who is like God. Right. That's what it actually means. The Mike, Micah, 
El. And El in the Bible means God. But, huh? Elohim. is a variant of God. But El, yes. So one who is like God, yes. So there you have it. So we see Jesus who led the war against Satan in heaven, defeated him, came to earth as a man. He became a man. And remember we said that he became a part of the human family? Remember we said that? And that the relationship between, between God and the human family is closer than before man sinned. Why? Because Jesus became a part of the human family, even though he's God and he created everything. But he became one of us, and the Bible says that we are joint heirs with him, and that we will sit with him and reign with him on this throne. Remember that? Because we, there you go. And so, he defeated Satan when he was on earth. And then, he is coming back again with the armies of Satan. Uh, with the armies of heaven to come back with the angels then one would have to ask a question then he's beating Satan when he takes so in the theater he's beaten you know <laughs> beaten in heaven before Revelation 12 get beaten on earth right couldn't get couldn't get Christ to sin tempted him harassed him you know crucified him but he resurrected and ascended to his father and he is coming back again. And that is good news, my dear, my dear friends. So let us continue. Question 5. What is the purpose of Jesus coming back to earth a second time? Revelation 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So the Bible says that Jesus is coming back with his rewards, to give every man as his work shall be. B, yes, my dear friends, Jesus is not coming back as a lamb, the lamb of God, to be slain, to go to Calvary, but he's coming back as king and as judge, give every man according to his word. Good. Number six, how will Jesus come this time for his people. Let us look at what the Bible says. First Thessalonians 4 verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right. So look at what the Bible says, that the Lord himself shall descend from where? From heaven. With what? A shout and with the, the voice of the? I wonder why with the voice of the archangel. <laughs> huh? Because what? Because he's in person? Because it is, it is him. It is he that comes. It is Jesus. Yes. And, and here it is again that we have another clue. He comes with the voice of the archangel and this only adds to the evidence that the bible gives us that jesus is actually the same person as michael the archangel and i must hasten to say something extra something more on this point that there is another denominator our friends um who are the Jehovah witnesses you know you know we love everybody yes so they are our friends too and so they teach that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Yes, they do. However, the only difference is that they believe that he was created at some point. And of course, you know already that we, from the second lesson, we, um, you know, we have um, declared and um, made clear that Jesus was not created. He is God, he is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, and by him was all things made that were made. Yes, and so we are clear on that point that Jesus was never created. He is God all by himself. He is the great I am. 
Yes, he was begotten and not made. Yes, I like that. Yes, that's deep. He said that Jesus was begotten, but he was not made. And that is a very um, correct statement, a very a truthful statement. And this coming from a, a man that was just baptized last week. <laughs> but very insightful, very deep, you know. I love that. So, yes. No. So, Jesus comes with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. My dear friends, we also saw in the sixth seal, when we looked at the seven seals last week, and we looked at the sixth seal, when all the signs in the heavens were fulfilled, the, the dark day, the falling of the stars, the moon turning red, and then the next great thing in the sky was, this, in the skies was the clouds rolling back, the sky rolling back, and Jesus coming. Remember that? Yes. And remember, we saw, we read where the people on earth who were unready, the kings and the rich men, bondmen, fled from his presence. Remember? And call on the rocks, the mountains and the rocks to fall on us and to hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the face of the Lamb. Remember that? Yes. So, obviously, when Jesus comes, it is a visible coming because people will see him and want to hide from his face. It will be an audible coming because... Of course, if there, are, if there's a, if there's earthquake and, and mountains are moving and rocks, uh, you know, to fall on people, that means that it is audible, it is visible, um, you know, and loud. And because the Bible says that Jesus will come with a trump, with the trump of God. And if our mere mortal trumpets are so loud, can you just imagine what the trump of God? would sound like, you know, when, when God blew him trumpet, you know, I can just imagine people can see in another galaxy outside the Milky Way and hear God's trumpet blow, the way how it's loud, the way how God's trumpet is loud, it can, work up, it can wake up even dead people out of them grave, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I digress, yes. Now, number seven, how will those who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior Go to heaven with him. First Thessalonians 16, we 16 already. So let us look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and shall we ever be with the Lord. All right. So what did the Bible say? How will the, the, how will the saved go with Jesus? They which, well, you know what? Let us read verse 16 again to get the full picture. So let's look at verse 16. DeAndre, would you mind reading, reading for us again? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. All right. So in verse 16, it tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise, shall rise first. The fact that the dead in Christ shall rise tells us what about the dead? Where are they? They are sleeping, laying, lying in their graves. They're resting. Absolutely, yes. And then we which are alive will be what? We'll be caught up together with whom? With those who died in Christ, right? Yes. So those who died in Christ, who rise first, are caught up together with those who are alive at the time when Jesus comes. 
that is those who have the seal of God in their foreheads, for it is only those who would have gone through the seven last plagues, those who would have endured the persecution of the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon in those final moments of earth's history. So it is they, along with those who are risen from the grave, will go to, up together to meet the Lord where? Yeah. To meet him in the air. So notice, my dear friends, that when Jesus comes, he will not come down to the earth, to touch the earth. For the Bible says that we will meet him in the air. In the air. Yes. And of course, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 more information about how this will happen. Because he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter um, 15, verse 52 thereabout, that those who are sleeping will yes in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump right um, they shall be raised incorruptible and remember we talked about that um, last night about how the human beings will be in heaven and we said that they will possess glorious bodies like Christ did when he resurrected. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians that, Jesus, that our bodies will be fashioned like that of Jesus' body when he was resurrected. And Paul now tells us in 1 Corinthians um, 15 verse 52 that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, those who are dead will be raised incorruptible and he shall be changed. He also says that this mortal will put on immortality. And it is at that moment we meet the Lord in the air with those who, who are alive. Absolutely. But note, my dear friends, that Jesus does not come down to the earth. And that is why Jesus said in Matthew 24, if you hear that Jesus is over there, don't go. If you hear that him up Jerusalem in the Middle East, don't go. And you think and, and you hear this now. You can't even see me not fire to see me for turn on TV. You know, and, and get a scene in live feed. No, if you have to do that. You know it is not Jesus we are dealing with. Because Jesus told us in the Gospels that when he comes, it, is, it will be as when the lightning flashes from the east to the west and every eye will see him, my dear friends. So no need for a live feed from CNN or Al Jazeera. Right, right from the Middle East or from Timbuktu no need for that all right wait, wait, so do we have a question when we read St. John 5 28 also it speaks as it says marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There you go. Thank you very much. So here it is, Jesus speaking, and he says that there's coming a time when all in the grave will hear his voice. Some will be raised in the resurrection of? The resurrection of? Yes, it's the resurrection of a, of a righteous. But what was it called in, in John 5, um, 29? Yes. Resurrection of life. Yes, the resurrection of life. Now, remember 
a few nights ago we said we talked about the second resurrection or was it a few sabbaths two sabbaths ago and i gave you a, a, a testimony when i where i <laughs> where i thought <laughs> yes after 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 meeting in a motor vehicle accident on a Friday night. When I should be at home having worship. Yes. And I met in that. We're going to make a girl move to go look for a young lady. Right? Knowing full well that my mother had come to come home for worship. And we said, but we're going to call worship this Friday evening. And I met in that accident, man. And momentarily, blocked out and then when I recovered my awareness after just coming out of a revelation seminar I was convinced that it, in that dark car I was in my grave at the second resurrection and it was the most awful feeling one could ever feel and that moment changed my life Never again, I said, I would want to experience that feeling to know that you know the truth, you know better. And everything just came to mind. I said, Lord, I'm mercy. It was, it was a Friday night. I'm always calling worship. And here I am at the second resurrection. <laughs> but thank God for grace that I wasn't dead. Yes. And um, God gave me a second chance. Amen. So that when Jesus comes, the resurrection of life and there is a resurrection of damnation, which we will look more into in a few moments. Just like to say welcome to the president of our East Jamaica Conference, um, Pastor Merrick Walker and Sister Monica Walker are here tonight with us. Thank you um, for being here, <laughs> for gracing us with your presence and being a part of the class tonight. Thank you, sir. All right, so we go to question eight. What, hap what will happen to those who have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior? In, and we look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. DeAndra? And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. All right. So the Bible says, what will happen to those who are unready when Jesus comes with his mighty angels? He will be taking vengeance on them who know not God and who... You know what? Did they obey not the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? So yes. And they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So when Jesus comes, those who are alive and who are lost, that is, those who would have received the mark of the beast, those who would have worshipped the beast and his image, they who will be alive, will be punished with his brightness, with his glory, and they will be like the ones who were depicted in Revelation 6, verse 15, in the seals, calling on the mountains to fall on us and the rocks to hide them from the face of the lamb for they cannot face Jesus so that would be the predicament of those who are unready for Jesus to come now question 9 where will Satan be when the saints are in heaven and the wicked are dead Revelation 20 1 to 3 and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, 
and shut him up. And set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed as this season. All right. So the, the Bible says that Satan is bound at the time of the second coming of Christ with a chain to, in the bottomless pit. Now, the Bible says that a seal is set upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Why won't he be able to deceive the nations anymore? Who wants to tell me? Now notice, we are putting things together now because all of these things we would have done already, we would have looked at them already. So, so go back in your minds and bring everything together that we have learned now. All right, hold on, hold on. What, what will be the condition of, on earth um, why Satan will be incapable of deceiving the nations anymore? The because the testimony of the Lord is finished. The testimony of the Lord is finished? Yeah. What testimony of the Lord is finished? Clarify. The, the, um, the, the judgment, you know. All right, the judgment would have been finished. And then what? Redemption. Draw right. near. Okay. But let me probe a little, a little deeper. Why is it that Satan is incapable of deceiving the nations anymore? Because there will be no one on earth at that time. <laughs> Jesus would have come, taken yes. the righteous, and the brightness of his glory would have slain the unrighteous. So there would be nobody on earth. Absolutely, that you are 100% right. So there will be no nations on earth to deceive because nobody will remain on earth when Jesus comes the second time. The, those who are unrighteous will remain in their graves and those who are alive and are lost will be slain by the brightness of his coming. So the earth will be desolate. And the Bible says it will be Desolate for how long? For, for 1,000 years. 1,000 years. It will be desolate. Now, there are some good Christian friends who teach that when Jesus comes, he will come secretly. There, well, there are different variants to this. So let me start with this one first. So there are some who teach that before Jesus comes, the saints, those who will go to heaven, will do so, will go to heaven secretly. They will just disappear. Yes. And they call it what? They call it secret rapture. Secret rapture. Yes. Because... What we saw in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, when the righteous dead and living are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and they are taken up into the air to meet the Lord, that is called the rapture. It is a rapture, yes. So they will be raptured. However, what I have just um, described that our friends teach is a secret rapture where people secretly disappear from earth and go to heaven. Yes. And they also have another variant of it to say that then there will be a time of tribulation on earth for those who remain, um, they will experience a seven-year tribulation. Now, from what you have seen in the book of Revelation, of how these end-time events will unfold, have we seen anywhere in the book of Revelation in the last days about any seven-year period of tribulation? No, no. 
And as a matter of fact, what we saw yesterday when we looked at Armageddon and the seven last plagues is that God's people will go through that terrible time of Earth's history. Didn't we see that? And as a matter of fact, Daniel spoke about it in Daniel 12 verse 1. When he, at that time, um, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was any nation on earth. But God's people will be what? They will be? No, not saved. Yes, of course they are going to be saved. But eventually they are going to be rescued. But they are going to be what? Delivered. They are going to be delivered. Yes. So God doesn't take his people out of the tribulation. They will endure the tribulation. They will go through the tribulation. They will be on earth when the plagues fall. But as we saw in the seventh plague, the kings of the east will come to deliver them from the tribulation. And that is what happens when the king on the white horse comes with his armies to deliver his people from the clutches of Satan and to defeat the beast and all the enemies of God at that time and rescue his people. So we have seen from the scriptures that there cannot be any secret rapture. There is no time of tribulation where only the people who are lost endure. There is no such thing. For we are at the point now where God's people are taken to heaven and for 1,000 years, Satan has nobody to deceive. We continue. Question 10, how will the earth be affected by the coming of Jesus? Jeremiah 4, verse 26, and Isaiah 24, 1, 2, 3. Deandra. And I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upon, upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied, and utterly spoiled. For the Lord had spoken this word. All right. So the Bible tells us that the, the, um, the full, full place will become a wilderness. The cities will be broken down. And the earth will be what? The Lord make it the earth what? Empty. And make it it? Make it it? Now look at the text. He make it the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and the, the Bible says that the land shall be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled for the Lord hath spoken this word. So again, we see where the Bible is consistent. I, the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah are consistent with the Apostle John, the Revelator, who, who declares from prophetic vision that earth will be desolate, no nations to deceive after Jesus comes for 1,000 years. Now, question 11. Does anyone know when the king on the white horse is Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. All right. So Jesus says, But of the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. No. I want us to be clear that even though we have never said it, uh, the remnant, the saints, none of us can tell or know, can predict the day nor the hour 
when Jesus will come. I want that to be crystal clear. Because there are people, again, some of our friends, um, some of our friends who love the appearing of Jesus, they are Adventists, you know, because Adventists are people who, is, is anyone who believes in the, the second coming of Christ or, or the coming of Jesus, the literal coming of Jesus. So some people who are, you know, very excited about it and, and they get, can get fanatical about it and will go as far as to predict the year when Jesus will come and said, oh, because according to this prophecy or that, uh, Jesus is coming in the year 2027, 2024, I don't know. But let us be crystal clear that we know not the day, nor the hour, nor the year when Jesus will come. But we are going to know the season. In that, Jesus said, when you see the signs all fulfilled, you know that spring is about to end and that summer is coming near. And so, my dear friends, someone asked in the Q&A a couple days ago, how is it that we live in such expectancy when the signs like the Great Lisbon earthquake in 1755 has already passed so long and, you know, the other signs in the heavens? Well, those signs only tell us that we are now in the time of the end, you see. But they don't tell us when Jesus is coming. They tell us that we have gone from one season in, in, in the time in the, in, in, the, in the time of earth's prophetic history into the final season of summer when Jesus will come. But as to the year, the day, the hour, no man knows, but we know it is near. And even more so, because we know when the judgment began in heaven. Remember, we looked at that in 1844, yes. And yes, we also looked in Revelation chapter 10 in one of our lessons where an angel representing God's messengers declared at the time when the judgment began that time would be no longer. There will be no more prophetic time after that judgment or message. No more to all the time prophecies that we looked at. You know, the 538 AD when the beast started to reign for 1,260 years down to 1798. And then after that, we looked at another prophecy that told us where the, when the judgment would begin in 1844. After 1844, there are no more time prophecies, you see. And so, what we know is that since the judgment has begun, we are living in the waning days of Earth's history. And so, it is incumbent upon us to remain in a state of readiness always for we know not when the final movements will wrap up and Jesus put his appearance. Look at the next question. Does Jesus, or did Jesus give any clue to alert us about the nearness of his coming? Matthew 24, verse 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. All right. So Jesus said that when you see all these things, and he gave signs, and the signs that he gave in Matthew 24 are the signs that we have been looking at in Revelation. 
signs in the heavens, unerring omens. Uh, we looked at the signs, with more specific and detailed signs in Revelation 13 yesterday about events that will transpire just before he comes. When you see all of these, Jesus says, know that it, I am near, I am even at the door, my dear friends. And what does God expect of us? What does Christ expect of us? He wants you to be ready. He wants you to use the information that you have been receiving over these past four weeks to realize the urgency of the time in which we live. The urgency of the decision that we need to make for him. And Jesus does not want us, my dear friends, to just um, accept his salvation and come and sit down in church. No, God's remnant church is a movement. God's remnant church has a mission and a mandate. Revelation 14:6. All the earth, all nations, kindred, tongue, and people need to hear the message, the everlasting gospel, so that they will have a chance to be ready for Jesus to come. And Jesus says, when you all make a decision to follow him, when you all become a part of his remnant movement, and you recognize your mandate, you will say to yourself, I will go and do the mission for Jesus. And when all of us go, my dear friends, Jesus says, when this gospel would have been preached to all nations as a witness, then shall the end come. So my dear friends, this information is not one for us to sit down on. But when we receive this information from the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, they should be like fire shot up in our bones. And it should um, motivate us, it should give us the impetus to go and to tell others that Jesus is coming, he is at the door, and we must get ready, my dear friends. Now, question 13. How should we prepare for the coming of the king on the white horse? And so the angel will tell us in Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying God ungodliness and where the loss, we should live sober, soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. My dear friends, we know that Jesus is about to put in his appearance. We know that the king on the white horse is about to come with the armies of heaven to deliver his people from world but Jesus says those who will be ready to receive him will have the grace of God in their hearts they would have received his grace that brings such the grace that denies ungodliness a grace that denies word loss that teaches us to live soberly righteously and godly in this present world I want to let you know that those who receive the grace of God in these last days, those who receive the seal of God and are prepared for his appearing, they will live sober lives. They will live godly lives. They will live righteous lives. They will have good family life, my dear friend. They will love their neighbor as themselves. They will be selfless. They will look to the interest of others. They will live a life of self-abnegation. They will have the character of Jesus embedded in them, my dear friends. Those are the ones upon whom the seal of God will be placed. And 
automatically, my dear friends, if they have Jesus in their hearts, they will lovingly obey him and keep all of his commandments, including the fourth one, which is the seal of God. The commemoration that Jesus is their creator and their redeemer. And they will declare to the world, for the Sabbath is a sign that they belong to Jesus, a sign that he is sanctifying their hearts, a sign that they give themselves fully to him. And so, my dear friends, those are the ones who will be ready to meet the king on his white horse when he comes. There is an old hymn that says, somebody says, when he cometh, when he cometh, <laughs> to, make, to make up his jewels. I wasn't thinking about that one. Yes. <laughs> but I was thinking more about, we know not the hour of the master's appearing, yet signs all foretell that the moment is nearing. When he shall return, tis a promise most hearing, but we know not the hour. There is light for the wise who are seeking salvation, and there is truth in the book of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation, but we know not the hour. And what are we to do? We'll watch and we'll pray with our lambs trimmed and burning. We'll work and we'll wait till the master's returning. We'll sing and rejoice every omen discerning but we know not the hour however the chorus says he will come he will come let us watch and be ready my dear friends he will come he will come in his father's bright glory but we know not the hour and my message to you tonight my dear friends in sanctuary on and online is that he will come, Jesus will come, Jesus, Jesus is coming, and he wants you to be ready. And so the final question tonight in this lesson, are you ready for the return of the king on his wife? I hear somebody said yes confidently. If you want to be ready for Jesus to come, if you want to be ready tonight, tonight you will have the opportunity to be ready. You, tonight you can make your election in the kingdom of God sure. And you do so, my dear friends, by committing to follow Jesus and allowing his salvation to take root in your heart. If this is your desire tonight, I want you to raise your hand with me so that heaven can record your decision tonight. Those of you who are online, you can say, I want to be ready in the chat. And there is someone here tonight making up their mind to follow Jesus. I know that some of us are in the valley of decision. You know yourself. You talk to me sometimes. We have conversations and you are in the valley of decision but message after message keeps telling us that Jesus is coming. We need to be ready, my dear brother, my dear sister. I pray that somehow tonight is the night that you will cross that line and tell Jesus that I want to be ready. I want to be in your kingdom when you shall come. And so I'm going to ask our dear president to pray for us tonight. I'm going to lay hands suddenly on Pastor Walker, our president, to pray for those who are in the valley of decision, those who are struggling with a decision to follow Jesus and his truth for this time, and for those of us who are 
of already made that decision to follow him that Jesus will keep us in his care and keep us faithful until the very end. Amen. For those online and those right here, let us pray together. Father, thank you so much for your manservant. Thank you for the book of Revelation that you have made clear through his voice. And tonight, O oh Lord, we raised our hands and we indicated that we want to be ready. Only two groups on earth, those who are ready and those who are lingering. The signs are clear that it's not a time for us to linger and procrastinate and delay making promises, but it is time, O oh Lord, for us to say yes, yes to your love, yes to the cross, yes to the resurrection, Yes, to be on your side. Tonight, O oh God, I pray that no one online or in the sanctuary will linger, but we all will say yes. And we can say yes with confidence because you have provided for us the power that we can live for Jesus in a world of confusion we can embrace the truth in a world of errors. So we have nothing to fear because you have given us the power. So tonight, Lord, we pray that we will come with confidence and we will know that our eternity lingers between our personal decision because the preacher cannot decide for us. The members cannot decide for us. And even our pastors who love us, as the members do, cannot decide for us. You have given us the power of choice. Every boy, every girl, every man, every woman, whether you are working or not, whether you are educated or not, whether you have a house on the hill or not, or wherever you dwell or whatever your condition, you have given us, Lord, the power of choice, and we can decide for ourselves. Help us tonight to say, Lord, as for me, I will follow you and be prepared to meet you in peace so that when the word is gone forth that it is finished, we will be on the Lord's side. And when the Lord comes and the trumpet sounds, we will be on the Lord's side. And on the resurrection morning, when we see the tombs are breaking up and the saints are uh, arising with power and immortality, we will be on your side. Help us, Lord, tonight as we break from this study that we will have that resolution, that we will not delay, but we will say, yes, Lord, yes. Thank you, Lord, for those who have already been baptized, they have accepted your truth. Thank you for those who are intelligent and loving enough to Surrender their lives so that the next baptism they will be in it and come and join the happy band of Seventh-day Adventists. Learning more and being equipped to teach the Bible and to rightly divide the word of truth. Accept them tonight, Lord, I pray. 
and help us all to be prepared to meet you in peace. This we ask in the wonderful and precious name of our soon coming King, Jesus Christ, our Lord, let the people say Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. We go to our quiz tonight. And for those of you who are online, remember that you can participate in the quiz too by quick clicking on the link. Now, as we prepare for the quiz, the ushers will give us hand out the envelopes for, for those who haven't received us yet. On Wednesday night, we look at the ball of fire and we will look at what happens after the years after Jesus comes. That is the next step. So stay tuned and come Wednesday night. Bring a friend and see what God has in store for this planet, for his people after the 1,000 years on Wednesday night. And so you are now ready for the quiz. We go to question one. Faithful and true are terms used to describe the white horse. Is that true or false? And you can write your answer. Don't shout it out. Don't, you know, be audible. Let's just write it. T or F or true or false. And I'm lingering. The questions are there lingering so that some of you who complain that we take them down too quick. The armies of heaven rode white horses. The armies of heaven rode white horses. Is that true or false? <laughs> yes. I see some of you looking at me blank. Like it's a trick question. I don't ask trick questions. Straightforward. Number three. Jesus will come back to earth to give out rewards to everybody. Jesus will come back to earth to give out rewards to everybody. Is that true or false? And fourth and last, Satan will spend 1,000 years on earth while the saints of God are in heaven. Is that true or false? Satan will spend 1,000 years on earth while the saints of God are in heaven. Is that true or false? God be with you. And we will now have our song um, by, by Ayata, our song of appeal, as you finish up your quizzes or your quiz, and we, then we'll come back for the Q&A and we'll wrap up tonight's proceedings. Shed for me, what a sight. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ayata, for your singing um, every night. And we are blessed, truly blessed by, by your ministry in song. Well, we are now here to do the Q&A. The panelists are here. And I know that the questions have been coming in fast and furious online. And I suspect that you may have questions also in, in house. But before we continue into the Q&A, we're going to do the answers for the quiz. And so let's go straight into it. Number one, faithful and true are terms used to describe the white horse. Is that true or false? I only hear one person. False. Okay. Right. Because that was it. <laughs> okay, I see some pe people talking now, right? Like, you, like it's a trick question, right? No, no, no. So it's a term that was used to describe who? The rider of the horse. The Jesus. Number two. The armies of heaven rode white horses. Is that true or false? <laughs> true. Yes. It also said that they, the armies, um, rode on white horses. Number three, Jesus will come back to earth to give out rewards to everyone. Is that true or false? The answer is? Some, some, true. The answer is true. Yes. Remember what Revelation 22, verse 14 says? That, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give who? There you go. So there you have it. <laughs> so whether you get your reward at the second coming, at the beginning of the 1,000 years, or whether you get it afterwards, you are coming, you are, you are going to get your reward. So number four, Satan will spend 1,000 years on earth while the saints of God are in heaven. Is that true or false? And of course, the answer is true. Answer is true. He, remember, he will be bound on earth with a chain and it, he, a seal will be put on him and he will be, not be able to deceive the nations anymore. Remember that? There you have it. So, so that's it. How many of us got all right? Numbers look thin this evening. But, um, and I see somebody, look, somebody at the front looking at me with a sour face. <laughs> As if I tricked her. <laughs> but the questions were straightforward. Um, you know, we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> Somebody's GPA for the graduation is, has been um, affected. But um, you can make it up in the next two quizzes. All right, so we are at the point of our Q&A. Um, but we have one person on the microphone already who wants to go first before, um, before we take those online. So you can go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. I would like to go back to the first question. Yes. When we started the meeting about if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Remember yes. that question? Right. Yeah. My response to that question is, You cannot do it by yourself. Yes. Right? So it's actually impossible for you to deceive the elect because it's God's seal. So therefore, those of you who even think you have a indomitable spirit and can do it by yourself, it's impossible without the sealing of God. So yes. that is my response to that question. Okay. And um, thank you very much for that. And you are, and you are quite correct. Um, for those who are able to stand um, must do so by the strength of God when they receive his salvation uh, through his grace and the Holy Spirit sanctifies them, strengthens them and ultimately seals them while they are able to stand. So you are, you are quite correct, my dear brother. You cannot, uh, we cannot do it on our own. Yes. 
All right, so let's go to, to, um, to some of our online questions. The first question here online says, question, Pastor, what effect will the new legislation have on persons who do not work on Saturdays? Will they be forced to work? Can they just obey the law by working on Sunday? Will they then escape persecution? Will the churches be forced to close? That's a, quite a multi-question. <laughs> yes. Right. The new legislation, is it referring to the Sunday law? I assume when it says new legislation, the national Sunday law that we spoke about. Yes. Right, yesterday. Yeah. Yes, Indeed. that's what they're Indeed. referring to. Indeed. So we understand that when this is enforced, churches, individuals will have to make a decision whether they're going to go along or not. Yes? And we, we told you that as we looked at the experience in the, in the past that individuals were persecuted because they refused to go along. Yes, when, the Jews were being, when Jesus was there after Jesus left and they were persecuting the saints, they were persecuted because they refused to go along. So we know that in time to come when the law is passed and in enacted, individuals will be persecuted because of their stance. We, we have said that You'll be praised before kings, yes, and politicians to answer for your faith. So we know that it is going to be a hard time indeed. And will churches be forced to close? Well, if you have to run to the mountains and hide, then your churches are going to be closed indeed. Yes? I, I say, Elder, if you are going to be working, forced to work on, on Sabbath, then you are going to close your church and go to the hills and mountains where you can worship peacefully away from the crowd, away from those who will seek to take your life. Definitely. And now for the next question from Pavel. If God is a God of love, I cannot reconcile God torturing people so much because they did not make it to heaven. Some people were born to be lost, born in the ghetto with ganja smoking, violence in their homes, mother with different boyfriends in their home. They don't have the chance to go to school and get an edu education. All they know is crime and violence from their children. Life is stacked against them. How can God punish them so severely because they did not accept him as Lord of Lords? It don't make sense to me from a God of love. Help me understand that. And don't tell me that you don't know you're a Bible scholar. I think you're referring to Ella Ranglin here. <laughs> that is what I hear them saying about you all the time. So let me make an attempt to answer this question before my other elders make an input. No, I don't know how many of you are listening keenly to the prayer that our pastor and president, Pastor Merrick Walker, was praying you would have realized that this question was being addressed in that prayer when he spoke about the fact that even if you're on a hill or you're not on a hill, even if you're poor or you're rich, he would have addressed it by making us all know that we all were given the power of choice. God gave everyone the power of choice. And it's not to say that so that it may seem as if we don't take these things into consideration. But what we are saying as pertains to this multitude of questions and scenarios and situations that is painted here is that if we choose God, God will certainly take us through these situations. And I believe there are many individuals who can attest to the fact that they face these similar circumstances and God himself brought them through because they chose Christ. Okay? Ella Ranglin, the scholar? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know about I'm sorry. I'm, me being a scholar. I, I don't even like the term yeah, <laughs> scholar. Yes, yes, I'm just a lowly servant of God trying to, trying to do exactly what the question is actually about. Because that is the reason why we do things like this. For, to so that we can tell everybody that comes within our sphere, all our friends, and it doesn't much matter your, your, um, your station in life, 
yes. you know, where you are from. Um, all is, uh, well, the gospel is, is meant to go to all people. Everyone. Every no nation, exception. kindreds, yeah. But, but there's another misconception that I want to just clarify in the first part of the question. Right. Where it says that you cannot reconcile God torturing right. people. God doesn't torture people. Right, that was an accusation. Right, and, and he doesn't <laughs> delight in even people dying or suffering. Right. Um, however, there are consequences for sin. Um, re remember we saw in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is, is death. Right. And, um, and, and if, if one doesn't, if, if one doesn't um, avail themselves of the free gift of salvation that God offers to all, whether you are educated or not. If, you don't, if one doesn't avail themselves to it, then, um, then ultimately they are going to experience um, the, the punishment or the wrath of God, Definitely. which we'll be speaking about on, on Wednesday, um, about how, how that is done. And I also just wanted, while you were reading the question, one thing came to mind was the disciples that Jesus um, called when yes. he was here on earth. None of them were scholars. None of them were educated. Um, they were from the ghettos of Nazareth. Yes. Um, they were from the lower class and, um, and largely uneducated. Yes. And so God used them. Christ used them while he was on earth. And that should, be, that should give us some hope um, for those who are in the inner cities that uh, the gospel is available to you also. Indeed. So, Elder, nobody yes. is born to be lost. For Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. Right. That whosoever. Yes. yes. Indeed. Okay, thank you very much, Elders. My All sister right. here at the mic. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. um, Could you just place the mic some more to your mouth? Up to your mouth. Yes. Good evening, Burger Chan sisters. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. But you need to put the microphone to your mouth, closer yes. to your Listen, mouth. Listen, look at me. Hold yes. it like this. Yes. Hold it like this. Okay, good, good night, everybody. Yes, good evening. Yes. How all you can, um, how you try to explain to somebody who wants to learn more um, about the Bible? Matthew 24 and 21, which speaks about, yes, unless those days were short, no flesh will be saved alive, right? So, instead of them thinking about it being a whole seven-year period, how do, you, um, how do you reconcile that? Okay, you you're referring to? That the, the tribulation is actually not seven years. Okay. How do you explain to an unbeliever okay. that the tribulation is not actually seven years? Okay. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, I get if you now. The promise is here to cut the time short in righteousness. Yes. So the question really is, how do we explain to a non-believer yes. that the tribulation does not last for seven years? That's the question, correct? Yes. Good. So we go with the scriptures. So... Daniel 12 actually didn't give us a time period. Daniel 12 verse 1, it didn't give us a length in terms of time for the tribulation. Oh, no. Right? It just mentioned no. that there will be a time of trouble such as never was. So it's only from that perspective that we could explain to a non-believer that it's not going to be a time period that we were able to tie down to seven years or any number of years. But that Daniel 12 verse 1 actually just spoke of the fact that there will be a time of trouble such as never was. And in that same text, we found great hope. It says, at that time, anybody recall? At that time, shall Michael stand up for his people. Okay? Okay. And if I may, if I may just, um, just add to that. Yesterday, we, we, um, we said that the that this happens, the time of trouble, yes. when Jesus finishes his intercessory work in the sanctuary. Right. And remember, Revelation 22, verse 14 tells us um, that he that is unjust, let him be, um, unjust remain still. unjust still, and so forth. Right. But after that, he says, and he says, Behold, I come what? 
I come quickly to give every man his reward. So, um, and when we look at the plagues, the seven last plagues, um, they are so devastating. We know that they, you know, they can't last very long. Um, the sun scorching the, 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 um, the earth, the waters turning into blood in the, yes. in the, in the rivers and the seas. So, so we know it is going to be rapid. We believe that the final movements, the final events are going to be rapid ones. Definitely. The next question is from Moya Gay Hamilton. What is the significance of the angel throwing the golden censer to the earth as mentioned in Revelation 8 verse 5? Okay, so I believe Moya is referring to an old lesson that we did, a lesson on the trumpets that we did last week. And so let us, um, let, let us read the Revelation, Revelation 8, 8, verse 5. 8 verse 5. Yes. Correct. Okay, so let us read from verse 4. It says, and this, no, from verse 2. And I saw the seven angels stood which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended before God out of the angel's hand. And then verse 5 and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And so the question is, what is the significance of the, the censer being thrown or cast uh, into the earth? So remember when we did that lesson, um, we said that the, the trumpets were God, God's response to, the, to what was happening to, 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 his, um, to his people, the saints. And, um, you know, at the point where the trumpets began, his people, his church, was being um, persecuted. Yes. And by, at first, by pagan Rome. And so their prayers... Um, depicted as being going up to heaven and, and being um, placed with the incense on the altar of God um, and then the angel taking the censer and um, casting it into the earth depicts God's response to his to the prayers of the, um, of the saints that cried unto him and after that the, the trumpets were then um, declared or pronounced on the enemies of God's people. So it's like a depiction of, of God's response to the prayers of the saints, yes. um, telling us that God is, um, you know, he is attuned to the cries of his people and he will respond when, you know, in times of trouble. Indeed. Yes. So the next question here, Moya Gay Hamilton, is there any significance in Revelation mentioning the second death twice, as seen in Revelation 19 and verse 20, and Revelation 20, verses 7 through to 10? Okay, so Revelation 19, 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived, and them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So it didn't say the second death, but we are, we, we are understanding that this is referring to the lake of fire as being the second death, even though the passage didn't say that. So right. this verse here says, who was cast into the lake of fire? The beast and the false prophet. Now, when you go to Revelation 20, it says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophets are. So it is just give, it is referring to the same experience, yes? But it's giving us 
the, the, the full picture by one verse saying the beast and another verse saying the devil was cast into the lake of fire. So there is no, 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 no misunderstanding or no, 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 um, you say antagonism between the two verses. It's just giving us the full picture by alluding to the beast and the false prophets and the devil in a different verse. Correct. The next question, Willis O'Brien. According to Revelation 19, verse 13 to 16, why is a king on the white horse's why is a king on the white horse's vesture dipped in blood? And the second question to that, and whose blood is it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fresh. Right, so right right along. <laughs> All right. So um, so this is a actually like a repeat of, yes. um, of a, a prophecy in Isaiah um, that speaks of the work of the servant of God or the Messiah. And in Isaiah 63, verse 1, it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed gar garments from Bozrah? Yes. This, that, this glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treaded, that treadeth the wine fat? And so this is a, a prophecy of um, the Messiah, um, the one who is mighty to save, coming back from the enemies of God, fighting the enemies of God, and, um, um, and his clothes are, are soiled by the blood of, of the enemies. Can you, if you can just imagine somebody coming back from a battle, you yes. know, with swords and all of that, and, um, and of course his garment is red. It, it, also, um, it also mirrors Revelation 14, verse 14, um, that speaks of, after the, that is after the three angels' messages are preached, then the next thing we see in verse 14 onward is the um, another angel coming um, with the, on the clouds, no, sorry, the son of man coming with a sharp sickle right. like, um, on clothes, the clothes of the angel to reap the harvest of the earth. And then it depicts the harvest as grapes which are fully ripe and, um, and, the, and, the, you know, and the wine press. There's a great wine press and he comes and he trods the wine press without the city. Um, and of course, the, 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 the wine, the, grape that's, the grapes that are fully ripe represent those who are, who are lost. That is the beast the, the, um, and the rest of the, those who receive the mark of the beast, etc. And so he, the son of man is here depicted as coming to fight, um, to deliver the saints, as we, as we spoke about even yesterday, um, from the, you know, those who are trying to, um, to kill them. In the, in the final moments of Earth's history. But he comes to deliver them. Michael, he says, say Michael coming to deliver them. But he is depicted as coming to battle again, just like in Isaiah, with his, with his garment soiled with the blood. And it is the blood of the enemies. So the, 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 so the second part of the question. That's the answer. Yeah, so yes. it is the blood of the enemies. Okay, thank God. you so much, Ella, for that thorough explanation. All right, so the next question is from Keisha Pissoa. Why will the devil be bound for a thousand years if no one will be left on earth? So let me attempt to answer this one. So that bone is not, is not being tied up, but rather a circumstance. Because the circumstance which presents itself is that there will be no one alive that the devil will be able to tempt. So the Bible speaks about these thousand years, which I was explaining to my wife earlier, that, that these thousand years, it was separate, both resurrection, the first resurrection, and the second resurrection. Right. So there's a thousand years between the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous, the resurrection of the just, and of the, the second of, resurrection, yes. the resurrection of the damned. Damnation. Right. Damnation. Yes. Right. So that's what occurs here when it speaks about the fact that Yes, no one be left on earth. So being born is really the circumstance. You'll have no one to tempt. 
to sin anymore yes. at that time. The next question is from no, Mary. Uh, no, maybe Go ahead, should, the last question that relates to that very one. Yes. That says somebody in the congregation who is afraid to come to the microphone wants to know what is <laughs> the importance of the 1,000 years. Or oh, the person's name is there too, but I won't call the person's name. <laughs> okay. It's a visitor. I'm not sure who it is. Yeah. But uh, I won't embarrass the person. No, but, that's what okay. is it? <laughs> but what is the importance of the 1,000 years? Yes. And we did it in a lesson in the Hour of yes. God's Judgment. Where it, so during the 1,000 years um, visitor, the, when the saints are in heaven, in Revelation 20, the Bible says that they are going to sit in judgment. Right. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, um, verse 9, that, this, that the saints are going to judge angels and, um, and the world. Right. right. So when the saints are in heaven for the 1,000 years, they are going to be looking at the records of the fallen angels right. who will be on earth and also those who will be lost. Because prior to Christ's coming, the angels that are in heaven with God and the heavenly intelligences and people of the other fallen worlds, they have the benefit of seeing God's, God's justice. Um, the decision, by looking at the record and seeing why God made the certain decisions. You know, during the 1,000 years, because God is God of justice and transparency, he allows the time for those who are righteous to see the records for those who are lost, both angels and both human beings who are lost. So that after the 1,000 years, when he executes his judgment, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because come Wednesday, that's yes. what we're going to be talking about. But when, but when the sentence is meted out, everyone will agree that just and true are God's work. Amen. Okay, Amen. I think the fire... Go ahead, Fitz. And, and you touched on something tonight, Elder, about the rapture. Yes. Because some teach that during that 1,000 years, some persons who never made it to heaven will get a chance, yes, to repent, and when Jesus comes back again, they will get a chance to be saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that. So we must be careful to read and understand what the Bible is saying and don't read into the Bible. Matter of fact, you will find the, the term, the, the theory of the rapture. Yes? And the word theory there is important because it's not biblical. Okay, thank you very much, Ella. In fact, Correct. that was the next question I was going to ask. <laughs> Come from uh, Mary Lopez. And she quotes uh, Luke 17, 34 to 36. And I'll just read it because you have answered it before. It says here, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men. There shall be two men in one bed. And the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. 35, two men shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Verse 36 and last says here, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. So that explanation was given by Ella Fitzroy White. They, those who read this text often interpret to support the secret rapture. But this text is not <laughs> referring to any secret rapture. In fact, Revelation 1 verse 7 says, All I shall see him. See him. Comes, yes. So it can't, it can't be secret if all I shall see him. Right. Okay? So we have another question here at the microphone. Go ahead, my sister. Yes. Revelation, like again, everybody. Revelation 20, 11 and 12 speaks about um, the great white throne and the great small and great standing before God. Yes. Could you explain to us here in the congregation what is going to happen to those persons who did never get a chance to accept Christ's message? Or even heard the name of Christ. What is going to happen to those people? All right. So you quoted the passage that we've been looking at at yes. Wednesday night. Definitely. So stay tuned for Wednesday night, um, and we will answer that question thoroughly. Yeah, just give us a brief snap. <laughs> no, we want you to know, invite your friends. Yes, invite your friends and come on here. And co-workers to tune into YouTube, and yes. also to log on to 
the Zoom. Yes. Right? Tell them you ask these questions because it's now being recorded on YouTube. And you would like them to join you to listen to the answer in the discourse that Ella Ranglid will execute on Wednesday night. Okay? Yes. All right. So if there are no more questions. So that's it for tonight. That's it for tonight. We Go thank ahead. you for your questions. Um, you have been a good class. Um, very engaging questions, very thought provoking. And we continue to, we ask that you continue to, um, to ask questions um, and we will answer to the best of our ability. Remember, we come back again on Wednesday evening at 7, 7 p.m. We, we look at the ball of fire and we look forward to seeing you and your friends. God bless you. Have a good evening. We hand over now to the host who will, um, who will give us the last item and send us home tonight.